Happy Sunday. Thank you, Dono. You guys are awesome. It takes a village, fam. Um, happy Easter Tide. We are celebrating a season of the post Easter resurrection where we uh, take time to remember with great joy and celebration. Christ's victory over sin and death. So, welcome to Flood. This is a great time um, to be here. Happy Easter Tide. Many of my friends have known me for being someone who is very passionate about passion. I love when somebody is just fired up. So, even if I'm not necessarily as fired up about March Madness as Matt is, I'm like, yeah, March Madness. You love it, Matt. Or my husband, Ethan, is like, code, Python. I'm like, yes, you love it. So I am passionate about passion. Um, so whatever your passions are, just like go for it. My first passion in life was my deep love for TV. I loved TV. And my friends over here in the youth section, before Netflix was like streaming and you just boop on the little... You, you know, you can binge your show all at once. You had to like order DVDs, like your top three CDs on Netflix, right? And they come in the mail. So as a passionate TV lover, it was a big deal when my dad got us a DVR box. I think I have a photo for younger generations who's like, what's a DVR box? Youth, do you know what a DVR box is? No, right? Did anyone have a DVR box? Yes, guys, look. Okay, we're learning. So just so you know, uh, when that red light would go on, it meant your show that you wanted to watch was being recorded. So as a TV lover, I was recording MTV Cribs, Fear Factor, uh, 90210, Monk. Um, what are some of my other ones? Vampire Diaries, Extreme Makeover Home Edition. I got it all lined up on my DVR box so then they would be recorded and then you can watch them whenever you want. So it just so happened that it was my spring break, maybe eighth grade or high school. I was like relatively old for what's about to happen here. <laughs> um, spring break, my family went out of town and all of my like amazing TV shows were having their either season finale or I think it was like Monk and maybe Vampire Diaries had their series finale. Big deal. And I was like, not a problem. I'm going to record my TV shows. Then when we come back from vacation, it's going to be like the Super Bowl of TV for young Rachel. So we get back, pull into the driveway. I'm fired up. It's about to be a TV binging dream. I'm just going to plop on the couch and crank through my shows. So I run to the couch. I'm probably like wearing gauchos. You guys remember gauchos 2007? <laughs> and hop on the couch and I go to turn on the TV for like best moment of young life and TV wouldn't turn on. I'm like, what? Turn on TV, nothing. And finally, like my dad comes in with all the bags at a normal human pace. I'm like, dad, what is going on? Like the TV, like I'm getting very dysregulated. And he's like, oh, sorry, I unplugged the DVR box. You remember the box, unplugged the DVR box. And so you guys say, oh, because you know what that meant. None of my shows were recorded. When I say I cried, I mean, I literally wailed. I cried and cried because for young Rachel, high schooler, it felt like my dad did not care about my passions and what I cared about. It's like, how could you unplug the box when you know my greatest passion is TV? So in Flood Youth, we talk a lot, I wish I had this language back then, but we talk a lot about intent versus impact. So while now I understand my dad's intent was probably not to communicate, I don't care about your passions, the impact was rather significant. I felt really heartbroken. So the reason I share this is because we are starting a new series on reconciliation. Uh, it's called Bury the Hatchet from Harm to Harmony. We've been in a series on forgiveness and kind of parsing out the nuance of um, receiving forgiveness and forgiving others. 
But now we're kind of transitioning into a little bit of the messy world of reconciling relationships, right? So reconciliation does not happen and it is not needed unless there's been a harm caused. Therefore, the topic of reconciliation is sensitive, it's complex, and it takes great wisdom. So I'm just gonna say from the beginning of what I'm about to kind of dig into of reconciling in relationships, I'm just saying this up front, not all relationships should be reconciled, right? So we'll get more to that. But luckily for young Rachel, whose heart was broken because I did not have the epic TV Super Bowl that I was looking forward to, my dad is a person who has great uh, sensitivity to when he harms the people he loves, and he's also very generous. So we did work together to find a way to reamp my TV career. So all is well. Uh, I still love TV, so come and talk to me about any new shows. I am always up for a new show. Um, so, conflict. It is a normal part of relationships, and it's actually uh, a very healthy part of relationships. But the question that I wanna get at today is, why engage in the potential conflict of reconciliation if it will require us to be vulnerable? It will require us to use our voice. Why even engage? So really kind of one of our grounding verses in this new series, Bury the Hatchet, comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the entire section is verses 16 through 21. Uh, highly commend it to all of us. It is like a theological gold mine that you can just sit in forever. Um, but just summarizing that verse, because it's not our passage for the whole day today. Um, why pursue reconciliation? It is because what we see here in 2 Corinthians is that God reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Do you know that you have a ministry? You have a ministry. It is the ministry of reconciliation. The passage continues on and says that you are Christ's ambassadors. You bring light to the world. You are his ambassadors and we carry in us as recipients, as people of Jesus who have uh, encountered love, who have received forgiveness, eternal forgiveness, and therefore intimacy with God, we carry with us a message of great and ultimate reconciliation eternally, but the kingdom of God is here now. We do not have to wait until heaven. The kingdom of God is here now. So our relationships that are messy we, are, as Christ's ambassadors, are invited into a ministry of reconciliation. Sounds amazing, right? Happily ever after, yay Jesus. If you have been a Christian for more than one week, you know that it's not that easy. X plus Y does not always equal Z. Evil and hurt do triumph, for now, in times. So when I say, yay, let's do the ministry of reconciliation, I say this with the complexities that, that we still live in a hard and challenging world. So with that, we are going to be continuing our Easter narrative that Pastor Matt left us off in, where we see Peter betray Jesus. Peter betrays Jesus three times, and now uh, today we are gonna be continuing what happens after this great betrayal. So I'm gonna welcome up our scripture readers. We have two amazing students in Flood Youth. We have Elliot Jackson. Elliot, why don't you come up here front and center, my guy? And then we have Anna Beckman. These are two sixth grade students. They are natural leaders because of who they are and their character. Um, we've got a baseball star here, and we've got a intellect reader here, so come to them for any wisdom in those areas. But if you are willing and able, will you please stand for the reading of God's word? Today, our passage comes from John chapter 21, and Elliot is gonna be starting us at verse 15. Go for it, Elliot. When they had finished, when they had, yeah, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, 
Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Thank you. You may be seated. Flood Youth, Anna and Elliot, will you take this back to your seat? Thank you both. I love having the students come and read scripture just because it reminds us as a whole church and them that the church is a people and not a building. So they are a very important part of our church. So that passage, it's a heavy one. Peter would be considered a bystander in his friend's murder. Talk about the need for reconciliation, right? And the first thing, one of the first things we see Jesus do is he goes to Peter. So in this topic that we're gonna be processing, massive topic, reconciliation, what I wanna focus on today is not how do we reconcile um, or necessarily why. We kind of touched on the why, right? It's what type of relationships are worthy and safe to pursue reconciliation. I kind of want to give us a framework of what type of relationships are safe to pursue reconciliation. When and how is it possible and when is it not? A lot of my content from today, I have to give credit and commend to, there's this podcast called The Place We Find Ourselves. Um, Ethan and I have spent so many hours listening to this. If you want to pull up the photo, it's called The Place We Find Ourselves. It's by Adam Young. He's a licensed counselor and a theologian, has his master of divinity, and is just a very rigorous student of the word. And this podcast has radically blessed me individually and Ethan, and therefore our marriage. And isn't marriage just daily reconciliation? So um, I'll, I just have to give credit to Adam Young, Dan Allender for their works on this topic. Specifically, if you're like, oh my, this is just leaving me with more questions, Rachel. Check it out. It's on Spotify. Uh, there's a series under this that is called How to Engage with Someone Who Has Harmed You. It's a five-part series. So I'm kind of summarizing that. Um, in light of our scripture for today. So let's dive right in. My first point that I want us to see in this passage is that love disrupts the status quo. Love disrupts the status quo, and I'm gonna add to that, by overcoming evil with good. Okay, that is a lot. Let's break that down. What we see here is that Jesus recounts the betrayal that Peter had with him. He does not sweep the harm done under the rug. He does not say, hey, hey, I'm fine. It's all good. I would have done the same thing. That was really scary. Jesus recounts it. He asked Peter three times, do you love me? For Peter to uh, redeem his betrayal, right? This is a confrontational moment that Jesus is engaging in and he invites Peter into a new way forward. He is disrupting the status quo of how their relationship is functioning. Aren't relationships kind of just like this ecosystem of how we communicate, right? And Jesus disrupts that because he loves Peter so much that he does not want him to stay on this path. He invites him into a new way of being. So what is the most loving thing to do when someone harms you? 
What is the most loving thing to do when someone harms you? I don't know about you, but for me, somewhere on my spiritual formation journey from a young person to an older person now, there's this like sneaky belief in my brain that love always means being nice, smiling, being kind, being sweet. But what I wanna propose in this first point of love disrupts the status quo is what we see in uh, this account with Jesus and all throughout Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is that the way Jesus loves people is not pleasant passiveness. Jesus is work, uh, he disrupts the status quo of when people's hearts are hard because he loves them. Here at Flood, we use the language of peacekeeping versus peacemaking. That kind of like, what, is, what do I mean by this first point? Peacekeeping is the temptation that I was talking about, where if I'm honest, if somebody hurts my feelings, um, I am tempted to just smile. It's all fine. I'm fine. I'll get over it. Um, let's just keep the peace. I don't want any negative feelings. I just want to have a good time, right? That's peacekeeping. Peace making is what we see Jesus encounter, right? Uh, God invites us into shalom, a way, a holistic way of being um, integrated with God, of wholeness. Because God wants shalom in our life, um, he is active in making peace, and that means conflict sometimes, right? So, there is this story at winter camp that I can't stop thinking about. We went to winter camp, youth, who went to winter camp? A couple of them, yes. <laughs> went to winter camp in March, and the speaker said this story that like seared it into my brain of God's love and kind of the tension of God's love. So this was the story. You guys are gonna remember it. This speaker used to work at Dairy Queen, and his favorite Thing was the strawberry banana smoothie. He loved it. He said it was like perfect balance of everything good in life. And one day he was making the strawberry banana smoothie for a customer and he basically, the band-aid went into, he had a band-aid, band-aid went into the smoothie. He didn't notice because it was kind of the same color, blended it up, served the smoothie. She drank it. It was amazing. And then he later looked down and realized his Band-Aid was gone. Visceral reaction, right? You're like, that, <laughs> that's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Nasty, oh no. Okay, our visceral, visceral reaction is that that Band-Aid does not belong in something so good and delicious, right? Not even just that, like, it's fine. It was just a little Band-Aid. No, it does not belong. The point of this uh, image is that God takes sin very seriously, right? And we don't always take it that seriously in our own lives or in the lives of our loved ones and how it's impacting us, right? We, if we wanna, you know, if we lean more towards peacekeepers, kinda wanna sweep it under the rug, but God is like, no, Band-Aid does not belong in strawberry banana smoothie. There is a better way of being that does not have to tolerate the ick, right? God goes so far to remove sin in our life so that we can be reconciled to him. Love disrupts the status quo by overcoming evil with good. Sometimes, this is kind of the main point I want you to hear right now. Sometimes the most loving, the most honoring thing we can do for someone is actually call them out. I don't know, maybe it's just churches I've gone to growing up. I haven't always heard that talked about in church. However, what relationships are number one, safe and potentially receptive of that and worth fighting for. Um, so 
I learned a new song this week. Maybe some of you know it. I'm not gonna sing it, I'm not a singer. That's for Jason and Kendall. Um, It's called The Gambler, anyone know it? Here's the lyrics that kind of summarize my point number two. Ethan loves old country. Ethan, is this considered old country music? Yeah, yeah, old country. So I I was like, Ethan, do you know the gambler? Tim told me about it. And he goes, you gotta know when to hold them. (laughs) Know when to fold them. I don't know the rest. Know when to walk away. Know when to run. This is my second point. We need to discern what kind of relationships we are dealing with, right? Our big question today is when is reconciliation possible and when is it not? So we need to be able to discern What kind of relationships are we dealing with? As the gambler says, there are relationships you can hold, fold, and please, for the love of God, run in some relationships, right? So when we look at our passage today, uh, John 21, we so far have seen that Jesus allows Peter to feel hurt. In verse 17 here, um, this is the second, the third time uh, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? I appreciate that this text says, right at the bottom paragraph, Peter was hurt. He was hurt. Uh, In uh, the account of Luke, Luke 22, 62, after the betrayal, it says Peter wept bitterly. This is healthy, this is healthy. So uh, I wanna give us a small framework if you're like, how do I discern what type of relationship, like you don't know my mama in law um, We're gonna talk about green light people, yellow light people, and red light people. So we can just kinda camp out on this photo. Let's start with green light people, people to pursue reconciliation with, Um, Adam Young from that podcast calls this your average garden variety sinner. Um, Many of us, right? We we also cause harm. That's a whole nother sermon. Um, I pray that we are green light people so that not if, but when we harm someone, we are soft hearted and responsive. But what do I mean by a green light person, a garden variety sinner? This is a type of person who when you say, ouch, they say, oh no, I'm so sorry. Oh my goodness, I can't believe I hurt you. Like they feel like, oh, they feel bad. We see that in this passage, John 21. Peter was hurt. Peter wept bitterly. He felt healthy shame and that's okay. So when Jesus confronts him, Peter's heart is soft so that they can move through reconciliation onto a new type of relationship. Uh, That is a green light person. Another image for this is if you're training a puppy, right, and they're really mouthy, they're sharp, tiny little teeth, you're supposed to do what? You're supposed to go, yip, right? You yip, and the puppy goes, ah, and they stop because they know like, oh, oops, I hurt you. That's how you train them. That is a green light person. Go for it. May we have the courage to share what's on our heart. I'm gonna jump to red light and then we're gonna camp out for majority of our time on yellow light. A red light person is what Adam Young calls, it's strong language, evil. Someone who does evil things for the purpose of causing you harm. It's a pattern that you cannot be in relationship with this person and also, honor the image bearing uh, part of yourself, right? You are an image bearer of God that is worthy of love and honor and being in this relationship or dynamic with this person is absolutely not safe. Therefore, we can process forgiveness independently of that person. That is what I would call a red light person, right? Uh, In processing with the staff, we always kind of talk through these topics and just share like, oh, this is what's been standing out to me in the passage. But one of the staff said, we're just kind of processing here. They said, you know, I find it interesting, kind of surprising, like not even God himself can be reconciled with an unrepentant sinner. 
not even God himself. If someone's heart is so hard, uh, I believe it's C.S. Lewis that says at the end there are two types of people. People who say, thy will be done, or thy will be done, right? Not even God himself puts uh, and compromises his total love and goodness, right? It is not loving to sweep evil under the rug. God confronts it directly, directly. That is a red light person, yellow light. These are the people that we maybe feel a little stressed about right now. People that we lack a little bit of clarity, we feel maybe discomfort, uh, some fear, some need for courage. These are the types of relationships. Maybe, maybe I wrote this sermon a little bit for myself, maybe this isn't you, but the relationships where it's better to just let sleeping dogs lie. Have you heard that uh, saying? Uh, I have a photo, these are my dogs. Um, so. I learned the hard lesson of why that saying doesn't work. I do not recommend it. Letting sleeping dogs lie, I really think, is the opposite of how Jesus loves people. But I did it anyway. So Joni is the one, the beautiful one, who crossed her paws like this. She's now four years old. You guys hear me talk about him all the time. I hope you don't get sick of him, because I don't. Um, <laughs> Ethan trained her, therefore she is like, uh, an AI, he does AI, an AI dog. Like she's like, I respond to commands. It's just, it's amazing. She is an intellectual being and also is a little sassy because uh, she's too smart. Mo, I told Ethan, I'm going to train him. I really want this cute puppy. I saw him on Facebook. I promise I'll train him. And look, he's like so cute and tender and he's a puppy. And I had like this thought in my brain, almost like this science experiment where I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna train him. And I just think he's going to grow into a good dog, right? It's just the energy. They're going to naturally become a really good dog. But you know what? It didn't happen. He's now a really big bad dog. He's sweet and nice and he's not gonna hurt you, but he's destructive. He jumps so high and I would not recommend letting sleeping dogs lie. Uh, the same goes for our hearts. The same goes for, therefore, uh, when our hearts interact with other hearts. Our hearts do not just naturally form towards God. They don't, with age, um, just become like a soft heart that is naturally like pursuing the things of the spirit. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics. For scientists in the room, I'm not gonna fully be able to conceptualize this, but I believe that it's the law of entropy, right? Things devolve into chaos. There is always going to be, like, we're tending towards disorder. At best, maybe we'll stay the same, but we're going towards disorder. So, what is my point? With a yellow light type of person, Jesus' love and honor does not just let sleeping dogs lie because he cares so much about the state of our hearts that if we're left to our own devices, we are capable, our loved ones are capable of making thousands of choices every single day that will callous your heart. So how do you um, unfreeze maybe a frostbitten heart a calloused, hard heart, it takes active uh, activation. We must warm it up. And what happens when you have like frostbite or you're really cold? That's going to sting, right? So with yellow light type of people, what I would urge you to uh, consider is with wisdom, right? So much of the Christian journey takes a lot of wisdom. With wisdom, consider clear boundaries, and courageous consequences. Clear boundaries and courageous consequences. John 21, in our passage today, Jesus has expectations of Peter. Things aren't going to go forward the way that they're, they've been going. We are completely changing our path and changing directions. I appreciate Brene Brown, um, her definition of boundaries. She explained it as what I need to love both you and me at the same time. What I need to love 
both you and me at the same time. Sometimes with more yellow light people, people who, um, and I, maybe we're the yellow light people. That's a whole nother sermon, right? Today we're just talking about if someone harms us. Um, but yellow light characteristics could be scapegoating, scapegoating, blame shifting, characteristics of narcissism, right? It is, it's mind bending. You might leave the situation being like, wait, am I the problem? Am I a narcissist? Um, Therefore, it takes boundaries and courageous consequences because the most loving thing to do is to not allow hearts to continue to harden. We are invited to use our voice, but it is also not our job to convict someone to actually feel something. That is the job of the Holy Spirit, to convict the world of sin, John 16. I want to share two examples of this. Ethan and I were going through the worst, most dramatic friend group situation. This was years ago, not here at foot. Um, It was horrible. I've never been in a position where someone I really cared about was hurting many of our friends. So uh, we actually listened to this five-part series I was talking about, engaging with someone who's harmed you, and I was like, everything I'm doing is wrong. I am so scared to put up boundaries and consequences. What if it gets turned on me and I'm abandoned? Totally scary, right? So we did it. We confronted the person. We said, ouch, right? Like, this is how it's hurt me. This is what we need moving forward. And guess what? It went horribly, like so bad. So, so bad. Like, uh, wow, horrible. So then um, we were like, okay, was, was hoping for better results there. What do we do now? Right, Matthew 7, I believe, uh, has that passage of don't give your pearls to pigs, right? So it's like when you, maybe with a yellow light person, give someone a pearl, a piece of your heart, Uh, That's very honoring to do. But if someone is not capable of holding that and they continue to drop it, continue to drop it, there's a time where no more pearls, right? So for us in our discernment, the best, most healthy, loving thing for both us and them was actually to completely end the relationship. That is so counterintuitive to everything I am. I'm like, that doesn't seem like the right answer, but... That actually was the right answer. That yellow light situation became a red light situation. Okay, better example here. Um, There's a person in my family that we're capable of getting into a very unhealthy communication pattern and behavior. And then I have a pattern of internalizing it, getting upset, being angry, and I just take it all in, 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 and it impacts me. So one day I was like, okay, courage, Rachel, courage. And I called them. I was just like, I gotta do it right now. I said, ouch. I said what I, I like, things can't go forward this way. It's hurting me. And to my surprise, they were like so receptive. Like I'm, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, thank you, yeah. And to this day, do we still have issues? Yep, we do. To this day, do I still get really afraid to um, hold boundaries, right? The energy it takes to hold boundaries. Do I still get afraid to implement consequences when those boundaries are crossed? Yeah, really scared. But that uh, encounter with um, someone who is capable of making me really angry because I love them a lot and I desire a very life-giving, healthy relationship, that person is worth fighting for and using my voice. Are you tracking? So, may our faith in God's goodness be greater than our fear of consequences. God is good. Our last point of today, verse 19, Jesus goes through recounting this situation, and he ends with a simple but not easy command. Jesus says, follow me. 
He calls Peter to follow me. In faith, may we surrender to God's provision. In flood youth, I asked, uh, we got into this debate. It was a great debate. I set them up potentially for failure because I wanted to get into some critical thinking. Uh, we asked the question of, would you rather have bad friends or no friends? And that oftentimes is the false dichotomy that we think we're dealing with. Well, it's either this kind of mid relationship or I'm totally alone and abandoned. So I'd rather just keep, keep the peace. Or Kill Bill line is I'd rather be in hell with you than alone. And that's oftentimes what we think are our options. But what I wanna put before us today is that you can trust in God. You can trust in him. When he calls Peter, follow me, it's because Jesus is worthy of following. You can just lay all your fears, all of your needs, all of your desires, your desires for companionship, your desires for closure. You can go to God because God is close to the brokenhearted. Where does Jesus go after he dies? To the person who is most hurting. Grief is a thin space where we encounter God. So wherever you're at in this discernment process, may your faith be what motivates you. Because God is close to the brokenhearted. There is a space for grief in this process. And I say this with great compassion as someone who literally has cried because I just needed a hug from God, like a physical hug. I, years ago, you've heard me talk about, but I have grieved and I grieved my relationship with my ex. It was heartbreaking. I felt like I was like not gonna make it. And I was so mad at God for like, I've tried everything with this person. I'll sacrifice whatever. And it couldn't work. It could not work. And there was a lot of grief, but in that time of singleness and grief uh, because of that situation, I experienced great intimacy with God. And ultimately, what I wish young Rachel knew is like, I could have trusted that God will be faithful to his word. Because now, fast forward, I never, ever, 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 ever could have imagined being married to someone as perfect of a fit for me as Ethan. He's my best friend in the whole wide world. His love is the most disruptive, sharpening love I could ever be partnered with. And he's a person I want to have conflict with. We are sharpening each other, we are pruning each other. Why am I bringing this up? Is because some of us may need to consider that there are relationships that we don't need to hold on to. And others of us need to step in with great courage and use your God-given, spirit-filled voice. May our love disrupt the status quo by overcoming evil with good. Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you with the complexities of our unique and personal situation. Only you know the depth of what we're carrying and only you know um, other people's hearts. Holy Spirit, we pray that there would just be your great movement in this room, that we would be people that are uh, fully aligned with you, with your voice. We want to hear from you. We want to trust you. I pray for anybody in this space who is in particularly grieving. Would you come near to them? Would you be close with them? Would you speak words of truth and your promises to them? Would you give them a hope and a great vision for the future you have planned for them? Because God, you love each one of us even more than we uh, care about our own well-being. So we trust you, Jesus. In your name, amen.